All right, everybody. So I am the only thing standing between you all and raffle prizes, drinks, dinner, whatever it is that you want to do. I promise I will try to make this as fun and painless as I possibly can. Before we get started, and I'll try to remember to say this again at the end, but when we're done here, if you're interested in any of the raffle or prizes or anything, you'll want to go back across the hall or over there where the keynote was yesterday. That's where they're going to do the closing and the raffle and the prizes, and you must be present to win uh, a uh, dinner out with Burke tonight. So that's actually, I think, the grand prize. So uh, my name is Brandon Satram. You can find me uh, on Twitter as Brandon Satram, and I would like to tell you a story about the greatest mobile computing device ever created. When this device was introduced, it was considered revolutionary. Not only did it give you the ability to take your data on the go, but you could seamlessly sync your notes, emails, and contacts with a simple click of a button. And most earth-shattering of all, it was a peer-to-peer -peer device, meaning that you could communicate with other devices like that one without relying on an intermediary or a central service. Now, what is this wonderful device? Well, the Palm Pilot, of course. When this device was introduced, there was nothing else like it. And one of the coolest parts about it was that little hot sync button on the bottom. You just plug it in, like hook this serial cable, don't, never mind the serial, the serial cable up to your computer, plug it in, push that button, and everything would, get, everything would get synced. It was amazing. And what's more, Palm devices could actually use infrared to beam contacts and email and even applications between each other. So you would see, uh, you know, 45-year-old white dudes standing in the middle of a, of, a, of a hallway at their business with their palms like two inches away from each other, beaming their digital, their V cards to each other. It was, it was a wonderful, glorious time. And I'm being a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but rea in reality, this was actually a revolutionary device. And the infrared capability was considered to be an indicator of the way that we would do computing in a more mobile world, in a world where, desks, where computing stepped off of our desks and moved into the world around us. It was the way that we thought things would work. And then it didn't happen that way. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why the Palm didn't succeed, but probably most of them boil down to the fact that the world wasn't quite yet ready for mobile computing the way that Palm presented it. It was a revolutionary device, as much as we tend to deride it today, but it never really saw adoption beyond techie business types who wanted to stop carrying around paper daily planners, if anybody remembers what those things uh, used to be. And when the world was finally ready for a device like this, we actually got something that was quite different. And as much as I'm not going to stand here and tell you that the iPhone was not a revolutionary device, I will stand here and tell you that it actually lost some of that uniqueness that the Palm Pilot had and, uh, and effectively gave us something that was no different than a client-server device. It was no different than the computers on our desktops other than the fact that you could put it in your pocket and make phone calls with it which, hey, don't get me wrong, that's pretty awesome. But it took out, stripped out all of those peer-to-peer -peer capabilities in substitution for something that could be centrally managed and controlled by Apple and mobile operators. So from this point on, effectively, peer-to-peer -peer computing has largely been relegated to the area of BitTorrent, to cryptocurrencies, and really, in a lot of edge, other fringe cases. We talk about peer-to-peer -peer computing uh, through, through these sorts of examples, but largely don't talk about it when we talk about mobility, when we talk about the world of the IoT in the future. And so what do we have today instead powering all of our mobile and online experiences? Well, of course, we have the cloud. The cloud's amazing, right? Um, as, as, as Rob just said here about five minutes ago, the cloud is just somebody else's computer. But yes, it is. It's amazing, absolutely. Uh, and in truth, everything that we now associate with the cloud computing is really just an abstraction on top of the client-server computing that we used from 20 years ago. Right? So from running our own data centers to having virtual private servers to what we call now cloud computing to container technologies to serverless to codeless approaches. And then I think Burke has something to do with some of this stuff now too. All of this stuff is just a set of abstractions on top of what is fundamentally still just a client server computing approach. 
I titled my talk the way that I did because ultimately I don't think that this approach scales to this. This approach will scale to the number of connected computing devices that we will have in the near future. The cloud is a fine model. It's great for even millions of nodes in a network. It's great for the billions of nodes that we have today, but I don't think that it will scale to trillions of nodes in the network. Now, most of us, I think, myself included, don't really think about this in terms of, yeah, well, sure, we think, yeah, sure, it'll, it'll scale the trillions just fine. I mean, it's a lot of computers, just add more. But I think part of the problem is it's really hard for us to visualize what a trillion of anything looks like because we don't ever see a trillion of anything in real life. When we think about even money, because trillion is a term that gets bandied about a lot when we talk about money, especially in the United States, where that's, we owe trillions and trillions of dollars to China and other countries around the world. When we think about a million of something, we look at it kind of like this, right? And we look at 10 million, we look at 100 million. You know, these things make sense to us, or a billion even. Uh, and then when we look at trillion, so I think our, our minds maybe work something like this. We think, okay, well, it's just three more zeros. You know, it's not, it's not really that much bigger. It's big, but it's not that much bigger. <clears throat> and I get it, this makes sense, right? None of us have ever seen a trillion dollars of anything in real life. No one really, other than Scrooge McDuck, right? If you've seen a trillion dollars of anything in real life, that is awesome. I'm very happy for you. But let's take a look at an example of what a trillion looks like in real life. <clears throat> so this is... Uh, on the left-hand side, lower left-hand side, that is a stack of $1 million US dollars in $1,000 bills. 100 million is basically a bunch of stacks on a pallet, and then a billion looks like 10 of those pallets stacked up and then lined up side, side by side. So this is what a trillion looks like. And that's in double stacked pallets, because if they were lined up side by side, it wouldn't even fit on this image. It would be too, too small. You couldn't see the little dude standing down there in the lower left, right? So this is a lot. <clears throat> and not only is a trillion a lot, but in terms of us seeing a reality where we have a trillion connected computing nodes on our networks around the world, it's not even a question of if but a question of when, and likely sooner rather than later, right? When we're talking and we're serious, and some people are, about things like smart dust, which are IoT-connected computers that are so small, they are literally the size of dust, but they have sensors and actuators and cameras and video recorders, and uh, you can sneeze someone someone else's face and infect them with computers. It's, it's kind of, it's, that's kind of the world that we're talking about in the future. This is going to happen, whether we like it or not, and it's a scale that we can't comprehend. We have hundreds of billions of connected devices, but just to say, all of a sudden that we can handle a trillion, I, I don't agree. I think, I think the cloud alone is not a good enough approach and the client server model is not a good enough approach for us to scale to that kind of world in the future. So then the question becomes, what do we do? I mean, we are developers here. We don't own or control any of the cloud computing vendors. So what can, we, what can we possibly do to prepare for this world? And I think the first thing that we can do is we can start by looking at the term IoT and cloud computing. Look at those things a little bit differently. And it starts with dropping this term and killing it with fire once and for all. And it's not just because it's buzzworthy and it's really starting to become a little bit overused, but it's really because it creates this subtle expectation on the part of both creators and consumers that, that is going to unwind this entire racket. And that expectation is the term internet in IoT, right? We're, by including this term in our discussions, we're subtly signaling to one another that everything should be connected to the open internet, right? Because if you have an IoT device, well, hey, you better have a Wi-Fi chip in it because it's got to get on that internet. It needs to be there so that you can, you know, flush your toilet from the other side of the globe. You've absolutely got to do that, right? <clears throat> we have got to change our perspective on this if we are going to succeed. And so what I propose instead is we use different terms. And the one that I prefer, there are others out there, is the term pervasive computing. I think this is more accurate representation of the world that we're trying to build. And there's two key parts to this term, pervasive, meaning everywhere, and then computing, meaning something's ability to just calculate, react, process inputs, 
right, create outputs. Nowhere in this term is the mention of connectivity. It is implicit and assumed, but because connectivity is going to differ for all of these. There will be pervasive devices that have to connect to the internet, but many, many more that don't necessarily need to and yet can still be connected to something else safely and securely. Now, don't get me wrong, the cloud is technically fantastic. It is a very innovative computing trend, and it's drastically reduced the cost of running a lot of new businesses around the world. We wouldn't have the, 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 the spirit and place of innovation that we have today, and just the ability to just create an idea at the drop of a hat without the cloud. So I get that. The issue, and my problem really is not so much with the cloud as it is with many of these pervasive computing vendors who tend to use the cloud as a panacea, as the place where everything needs to get connected, as the area where we default all of our solutions. And I think that there are a lot of flaws in this approach, and they really come down, they, they tend to manifest the flaws, and we've all seen these in devices we've owned or in uh, solutions that we've built, but it really tends to manifest these problems in one of three ways. Either when vendors create devices that you don't own, when they create devices with poorer security, or when they over-engineer devices. And I want to talk about each one of these in turn. Ownership in the world of pervasive computing is really interesting because because of vendors' reliance on DRM, as well as the presence of the cloud connecting all of these devices. It creates a potential for a world where you don't actually own even the devices that you purchase. Now let's talk about DRM for a second, because it's something that we're all familiar with as consumers, especially in the media space, right? VHS and cassette tapes, DVDs and CDs, and other forms of media are intellectual property that are protected from illegal copywriting. A lot of the current law around digital rights management is actually covered under a U.S. law called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or the DMCA. Section 1201 of the DMCA basically says that it is a felony to remove a digital lock from something, even if you have a good reason to do so. And the, and the penalty for that is five years in prison and up to a $500,000 fine in U.S. dollars. And regardless of what any illegal or unprovable things that some of us may have done with Napster and Winamp between the years of 1998 and 2001, I think that we would all tend to agree that DRM is generally a good idea, at least when it comes to certain kinds of media. I think what many of us would be surprised to hear, however, is that DRM applies to much of the firmware that is in a lot of the smart home and IoT devices that we purchase, that we put in our homes and around our cities and in buildings around the world. And it's afforded the same protections. So when I say that it's illegal to remove a digital lock from something, even if you have a good reason, that applies to your smart bulb, to your hub, to your connected toaster, maybe. Um, it means is that security researchers can't even publish the security flaws of DRM-connected devices because they're not allowed to break those locks. Now, the FCC earlier this year did actually, uh, did, did actually create a, a temporary exception to that where security researchers could break locks and publish security flaws, but it was temporary in nature. It was a trial balloon. They may actually undo that later on. <clears throat> But as a consumer, what it means is you can't hack your smart home hub without breaking the law, right? If it gets taken offline. And that kind of thing actually happens. So one good example, and I'll give you three because I think they're all quite interesting and worth sharing. In 2015, Philips actually pushed an update to their Hubridge software that made GE bulbs that, prime, that uh, formerly had been compatible with their bridge, it rendered them completely unfunctional. You could no longer control those bulbs with their bridge. So, Imagine a scenario where you had, you had gone to a hardware store or you had gone to Amazon and you purchased one of these bridges and some of the Philips bulbs and then because they were on sale and compatible, you also got some of the GE bulbs. And then come to find out at some point after you apply a mandatory update to that bridge that now some of those devices in your home don't actually work and you had no say over it. Because guess what? You don't actually own them. Another story from last year that I found really interesting and kind of nefarious is regarding the Revolve Smart Home Hub, which had been purchased in 2015 by Nest. Now, sometimes happens in the technology world, Nest decided that the Revolve Hub uh, was no longer a viable product and announced that they were going to be sunsetting it and shutting it down. But that's not really the most interesting part of the story. The most interesting part of the story is because this device was 100% cloud dependent, once the Revolve was taken offline, the units were actually completely unfunctional. They were basically just $300 paperweights at that point. 
And because of DRM, you couldn't actually go into that device and unlock it to get it back online. Now, <clears throat> Nest and ultimately their parent company, Google, did not do this to be jerks. They didn't take this system offline and render everybody's devices non-functional because they were bad actors. It happened because built into the device was a dependency on the cloud. And when they decided to shut those servers down, the device went kaput. There was nothing that they could do about it. And here's another example from just last week, actually, from one of the Internet's greatest Twitter accounts, Internet of Shit, at Internet of Shit. Please follow at Internet of Shit. And I think that was my last one for a PG-13 rating. So the Harmony Link device uh, was announced. Uh, Harmony actually announced that they were going to take that offline in 2018. And that was it. They were, EO they were EOLing or EOSing the device, and ultimately you just had to buy a new one. It was five years old. And so Harmony could argue, well, it's five years old. Everybody needed new hardware, right? Uh, but they didn't give consumers that choice. They didn't give them the ability to say, you know what, you're just going to stop supporting it, but you can keep on using it. The best part about this story, best part about this story, is that they were actually censoring forum posts where people were actually talking about taking legal recourse against the company. So if you went to their forum and you typed in, like, class action, it wouldn't let you post. It would actually, like, make you remove it or remove it automatically. So what's my point in all this? The cloud gives IoT vendors the ability to lock you out of your devices anywhere and any time. I know that sounds dramatic, but I mean it to be because it is absolutely true. And that's the first problem. The second one, and is related, is where the cloud enables porous security in our devices. So I'm sure many of us are familiar with the annual Black Hat and DEF CON conferences that take place in Las Vegas. This conference that has drawn hackers and security researchers from around the world for the last 20 years is, uh, is a large conference, and it's, it's, it's been seen as the, a bellwether for some of the largest challenges in the security space. So it's been interesting to see where interest has migrated over the years in the types of things that hackers are focusing most of their attention on. In 1997, you'll find it no surprise to hear that this was Microsoft Windows. That's what everybody was talking about, hacking and breaking. About 11 years later, it was the iPhone. And then in the last two years, it's been smart homes and the IoT. And draw an interest of over 50 sessions dedicated to hacking, to hacking uh, thermostats, homes, cars, toasters, and anything that you can possibly imagine that's been connected to the internet. And what's happening, it's not just about academic interests, but researchers are actually finding and publishing flaws that are in the wild in these devices. These are not just theoretical. In 2016, one of the more prominent smart home hubs, Samsung SmartThings, which was an acquisition on Samsung's part, uh, was revealed to have serious flaws by security researchers at the University of Michigan. And they published a paper, sample code and videos, illustrating how they could use flaws in the SmartThings system to fire off dummy fire alarms, to gain access to devices, and even set up secret codes on smart locks that would allow entry into other people's homes. Most of these flaws were, were actually exploited by overprivileged third-party apps in the SmartThings marketplace. For instance, a battery power monitor that would then send SMS messages to the developer anytime you tried to change your PIN code in the, uh, in the admin application. So my bottom line here is that any device that you can access from anywhere in the world is a device that anyone can potentially access from anywhere in the world given the right breaks, given the right capabilities. And then finally, let's talk a little bit, a little bit about over-engineering and how sometimes the cloud leads to vendors creating these over-engineered devices, ironically because it tends to be the, low, the, least, the least friction path for, for them to proceed. And for this example, because there's no one from Amazon here, I'm going to pick on the Echo. Um, <clears throat> I have several of these devices. I, there's, it's no secret that I'm a fan. I have good friends that work on the Alexa team at Amazon. Uh, it's really an amazing device. And it's one of those that I think back on when they, uh, when they pushed the first ad for it, I'm like, that's the dumbest thing ever. Why would anybody want that? And now everybody loves it. Um, so <clears throat> the Echo is an interesting device. And it's, it's cool that you can do things like, say, Alexa, turn on the kitchen light. And then what happens in the background is that the Echo determines what it is that I want to happen. And then it fires that off to a translation service and then passes that off to a skill, uh, to a smart home skill that I have installed that the developer created that then passes that off to their device cloud that then steps back into my house. So open internet, 
into my house and turns on or off the kitchen light. When I described this to my wife last year, she actually gave me a demonstration of another way to turn off lights in the house as well. <clears throat> Interestingly, there are more exotic approaches you can take for turning on and off lights that take less time than the Echo. Now, and I'm, and I'm, I'm not being entirely fair to the Echo, because the reality is there's a very complex aspect of this entire system that I don't want to undersell, and really, in many cases, does require a little bit more computing power than you can probably cram into that black cylinder, and that is determining, through my voice and my words, what it is that I want to happen and the object that I want the device to act on. That's all pretty cool. But to be honest, to, the, to an everyday consumer, most people find it odd that a simple operation between two devices in the exact same room require traversal across the open internet in order to accomplish. Right? And in fact, most consumers don't even know that that's what's actually happening. I think that they assume, because these devices are in the same room, why can't they speak to one another? And the reality is that they can. There are ways for this to happen, and, those of, and, we, and we all know this because we are technologists, because we're intelligent people, but the cloud is used as a low-friction option. It is the easiest way for us to enable an interaction, right? It is the easiest way for a vendor like Samsung to create a, to create a capability for, to put a mobile app on your phone that allows you to turn off and on lights from anywhere in the house or anywhere in the world. So given all that, how do we save the world from cloud computing and from the Internet of Things in itself? Uh, so what I want to share is a couple of things, a couple of ideas for, I believe, how we can change the way that we build apps. Again, we don't have control over these vendors. We can vote with our wallets. We can vote with our feet, sure. But we can also change the approaches that we take to how we build systems, how we build devices, even if we're web developers, even if we're mobile developers and the types of things that we build. So there's three rules or three principles that I want to share. The first is to change the way we think about connectivity. So rather than connecting everything to a cent central server in the open internet, I think we can push communications to occur between peers on a limited subnet, which should come as no surprise that I'm going to come back to this. If you'll recall our good friend, the Palm Pilot, this, this means we think about the use cases for device communication between devices as opposed to only on a central server. Uh, last night before dinner, actually, uh, Christian Heilman was talking about a trip that he had taken down to Africa. And because of a lot of the issues, because people down there don't tend to have smartphones and tend to rely very heavily on SMS, that there have been a lot of creative ways that people have figured out how to exchange information and data with one another. And, these all, and every single thing he described was peer-to-peer, -peer, that they've actually figured out a way to socially hack SMS short codes and send each other money so that they didn't have to pay fees. And they've also figured out how to install apps on their feature phones that allow them to share apps between phones without relying on a central server, if this sounds familiar. Right? The world, by necessity, what's happening in many places of the world is that we're moving back to these approaches because they make sense, because they, they do not require us to cede control to a central party. Now, what it means is, in, in my mind, that we need to revitalize the peer-to-peer -peer model when it comes to pervasive computing. Now, bear in mind, however, that I'm actually not talking about cutting off our devices and reducing the Luddite status, but just being smarter about which devices that we do allow to, uh, had to have an open internet connection. The home space, the smart home space is actually a pretty decent example of where P2P can be useful. And there are some devices that actually do this already today. The most popular tend to use the Z-Wave standard. And by popular, I don't mean widely adopted, because a lot of the smart home hubs out there are kind of garbage and hard to use. Uh, and they've been around for a while, so that it's, a, it's a definitely an opportunity for disruption if anybody's looking to build smart home controllers. Uh, but a lot of these devices, Z-Wave devices, tend to rely on mesh technology in order to communicate with one another and to communicate with the home controller. So what you can have in your house is you may have edge devices that are too far away from the home controller, but that but they're actually pretty close to the next device in the mesh and can actually send packets to the next one, which will send to the next one, and which can finally communicate with the home controller. So they've actually created a pretty smart system for doing a lot of this. The problem with Z-Wave is that it's proprietary, which kind of pisses me off. I mean, these things should actually be open, and our ability to use 
use these things. Uh, you know, we need to foster an ecosystem where people want to do this, not by going through again a central authority. Even if you're not, you're doing peer to peer, but now you have a single party that's responsible for getting your devices on the network or blessing your ability to be on that network. That's kind of annoying. Thankfully, Z-Wave was reverse engineered, and so there actually is an open Z-Wave, well, not reverse engineered. So the Z-Wave folks did actually publish their spec. They didn't open it up, but they published it to where someone else could create an open implementation. So there is an open implementation, uh, and there are other great things out there. And the bottom line here is that we need to look beyond devices that say, yeah, we connect, there's Wi-Fi inside. Right? No, no, no. But devices that connect in different, more interesting ways. Devices that use ubiquitous approaches like Bluetooth or that are starting to look at things like LoRa or Sigfox, right? That we start to look for devices that find other alternative methods to communicate with one another. And ultimately, I think what we get is something that looks a little bit more like this, that when your devices, the devices in your smart home, in this example, when they are connected, that they can communicate with one another, that they can communicate with a hub, but only one or two most pr approved devices are actually the devices that are communicating with the outside world. Now, assuming we can change our perspective about connectivity, and then we move more towards peer-to-peer -to -peer networking models, we still have a scale problem when we talk about trillions of devices, right? Um, when IPv6 was first announced, a lot of people would, would say, man, we're going to have so many IP addresses. We're going to have more IP addresses than our grains of sand on the Earth. And that's cool, except for the fact that we're about to have more network devices than we have grains of sand on the Earth as well. So we need to be smart about the way that we think about these problems and just assume that we're kicking the can down the road and, and really acknowledge that when it comes to our current models of network design, <clears throat> that we need to function less like city planners and more like ecologists in many ways. And the reason why I make that distinction is because when a city planner thinks about a system, what they're doing is they're saying, okay, I know the surface of what I'm designing. I know everything. I know the, the, the area, the square footage area that I have. I know that I need a, a football stadium and a uh, Applebee's and a bunch of apartment buildings and a swimming pool. And they define all those things and they put them on a nice little graph, right? They control every variable in the system to where the storm drains are to where public transit goes and things like that. An ecological approach is different because in an ecological approach, all you can control is setting up the system and some of the rules within which actors in that system can operate, and you're leaving everything else largely up to chance and for the system to regulate itself. And I think that's the, that's the only way that we're ever going to be able to handle the scale of devices that are out there. Again, I mentioned smart dust earlier as that sort of pie in the sky, edge, sci-fi sounding IoT world. But in that world, can we really control down to the individual speck of grain the, everything that's happening with those devices? Do we really want to, to offload that amount of computing and that amount of control? And so what's interesting is that honeybees are actually a pretty great example of what a self-running ecology of devices could potentially look like. The key here is that every type of bee has a very important role that not only ensures growth of the hive, but keeps the hive running. And there's a, quite a nice symbiosis between all of them. And it really starts with the queen, the connection to the outside world. Uh, she mates with a drone to begin the hive. There's only ever one queen in the hive. She ensures that the hive continues to grow by laying eggs. And then when necessary, when the hive needs to split, she's broken off to form a new hive when needed. What's interesting about honeybees, if you've ever stu studied colonies or, uh, or anything like that, is that the, the queen is actually not the central authority within the hive. She is the queen. She quote unquote presides over the hive. But the real power brokers in the hive are the worker bees because the worker bees are responsible for collecting food and water, for caring for the larva, for creating a new queen when needed, and then killing off the other potential queens before they hatch. And then finally, and most importantly, for keeping the, the hive healthy by eliminating drones when they no longer contribute to the hive. And then drones are, drones are idiots, right? All they do is they're responsible for mating with queens to start new hives, and that's it. And as soon as a drone has either accomplished that job or not, they're banished from the hive, they starve, and they die. They don't have stingers, they can't do anything. Uh, their sole responsibility is to help with pro procreation of the hive, and that's it. 
So how do we design a hive-like pervasive computing network? There are a lot of ways, but I actually think that one that looks a little bit like this is actually kind of interesting. And in this model, there are three discrete types of devices, and each one has a very specific role. So hub devices, effectively your queen, are responsible for secure internet communication, and they're the only type of device on the network that can do that. They ingest external data, and they can, can provide some process-intensive services that need to be offloaded, perhaps, from smaller devices that don't have as much compute power. Sentinel devices are probably the newest to this model, and one that I don't, we don't have, really have a good example for today. Intel and other providers have these things called IoT gateways that allow devices to, uh, to connect to them, but they typically function more like ingestion devices that allow devices that, that allow edge devices that speak different protocols to talk to one another and to get their data into the, uh, into the underlying system. One change that I would make in a system like this is that Sentinel devices actually have the ability to not only deliver updates to edge devices, they could be the broker to ensure the devices stay online, but they also would be responsible responsible for detecting threats and disabling rogue devices when they start acting like idiots or when they start doing things that they're not supposed to do. The way that this could potentially look is that if you had something happening in your own network, like let's say, for instance, your toaster went rogue for some reason, and shame on you for buying an internet-connected toaster, for God's sakes. If it went rogue, the Sentinel would be able to detect that and effectively eliminate it, update it, or take it offline completely until it can be manually serviced. It's an interesting change. It's definitely a difference in the way that we operate today, but, but what needs to happen, and the, the takeaway that I want to share for this particular model is that allowing these actors to each have a very specific role also requires that they can't be multi-functional devices now. So if we have hubs today that sometimes act kind of like gateways or uh, that also have sensors and actuators, then you need to allow these devices to function independently and to just fulfill their role. And the other important thing to note is that this model, this model really does require that we seed having absolutely the scripting everything that actually happens in a network. And I don't know specifically what that looks like. I think we're gonna, we're gonna have to take some time over the coming years to iterate on how do we actually set up smart devices that, yeah, they have an operating procedure, they have commands that they're supposed to follow, but that there is the presence of devices on the network that do have the ability to regulate other devices, to take them offline, to govern them, regulate them, et cetera. It's definitely a change in thinking. But assuming we can go to peer-to-peer, -to -peer, and assuming that we can think about systems design like this, what that really gives us the opportunity to do is solve that last piece of Internet of Things, of pervasive computing, that nobody seems to have figured out yet. And frankly, if we don't get this figured out, none of this stuff is ever really going to happen the way that we want it to. Because as long as everyday consumers are afraid to buy light bulbs because they think they're going to like kill them, then we're not, gonna, we're not gonna be able to have a world that is connected, a world <clears throat> that really maximizes the technology uh, and, the, innova and the, the technology that we have out there and our ability to leverage it. So security is a big problem in the IoT. The good news is that if, we are, if we've already adopted a peer-to-peer -peer network and if we've built more of a hive-like network, we're actually already closer to a more secure setup. For starters, we, we, get, we get to this place because the number of devices connected to the open internet has now been minimized, right? By taking more of a peer-to-peer -peer approach and by limiting the connected devices, we've created a smaller attack service. That's great. And in addition, if we've figured out a way to design networks that use sentinels and we're using them for network monitoring and device pruning, uh, we have another layer of protection if there's a security breach on the network. But we can take this even further. And I think this talk yet does not have enough buzzwords. I've already said IoT and cloud computing. I think the real last piece of this puzzle is we need us some blockchain. Because every great idea these days, you take a good idea plus blockchain equals great idea. Okay? <laughs> so that's what we need to do. <clears throat> And while I'm being a bit tongue-in-cheek, in all seriousness, what we're talking about is related to blockchain, but it's not the same. The real term for what I want to talk about is referred to as distributed ledger technologies, or DLT. DLTs rely on a consensus model of shared and synchronized data. That's it, right? They don't centralize data storage for their operations, <clears throat> and um, they rely on P2P networks and consensus algorithms 
for auditing behavior. And what I mean by consensus algorithms, what happens in cryptocurrencies today is that every, every actor, every node on the network that has a copy of the ledger votes on whether or not every single next transaction is going to happen. And if over half of the nodes vote yes, the transaction is committed and it's added to the ledger, everybody gets a new copy of the ledger. That's your consensus. I'm, I'm oversimplifying it, but those are your consensus algorithms. Blockchain is a distributed ledger technology, but DLT is not blockchain. There are other examples. It's one approach to creating one. And in the world of distributed computing, it's actually, it's actually a little bit overkill. When somebody talks about what the IoT needs is blockchain, um, they're not correct. However, their, their head's in the right place because, frankly, the idea of having that distributed model for uh, the, the distributed model for tracking and auditing behavior on a network is a good idea. The aspects of blockchain that we don't need in distributed computing are things like having mining rigs and things like that. It doesn't add any value. Uh, those aspects of, of Bitcoin don't add any value. So there are a few competing ideas out there about how all of this will work, but the general idea is to take the principles of distributed ledger technologies and set up auditing within networks of devices. So what does this actually look like? So as with cryptocurrencies, kick this off. Hold on a sec. Uh, as with cryptocurrencies, every interaction on the network is logged to a synchronized ledger, and a majority of nodes on the network uh, will vote on whether or not they can approve every single transaction. Um, so the general idea is that DLTs create another layer of audit. So as information flows on the network, that we're making sure that everything is on the up and up. So if some uh, hipster with a handlebar mustache actually shows up on your network and attempts to, again, hack your toaster, shame on you, uh, the next transaction in the network will fail. Again, I'm oversimplifying here right now. And there's a lot of specifics that have to be figured out in terms of what this looks like. But the general idea is that there's another layer of making sure that audit happens to determine, is this device still a good actor? Does it need an update? Did it get an update? What data did it just send? All of these things are logged in a distributed ledger that is not synchronized. And every time one of these transactions take place, there is an audit from other actors, other nodes on the network to determine that it is a legitimate, uh, that's a legitimate move. And again, the presence of those sentinels allow you to then render the device uh, unusable or take it offline or update it if that becomes a problem. So these three things together are really interesting, but it's definitely, in some ways, an evolution of what we're already doing in some spaces like the smart home or in smart cities. But in some cases, I think it is going to have to change the way that we operate as consumers and then also as developers. And so to wrap up, I want to share a couple of sort of personal uh, recommendations or personal ideas for folks. And as consumers, as those of us that buy first and foremost, and for parents and family and, th and, and folks like that, I think it's important that we start being more critical, at the, critical of the kinds of devices that we tend to buy. Um, five, six years ago, I think it was really easy to just be okay with buying a Nest thermostat or a Nest cam because that was the, it, was, it was dead simple. You get it on your phone and I can be here and it's like 8.30 in the morning and I can see what my kids are doing in the kitchen and that's really awesome. Um, except that there's like registries of like Nest cams that, online that you can go and see, like what's, get, get access to everybody's Nest cams and go and see what's happening in their house too. Uh, we need to be more critical about buying devices that don't necessarily just present a Wi-Fi chip, and that's it, right? Um, my recommendation is that we think more about buying those kinds of devices and, uh, and putting those kinds of devices in our, own net in our own networks and recommending devices that use Bluetooth and other new emerging standards as a way to create connectivity to a network instead. Also, and this is a tougher one because there aren't really any out there right now, um, and I guess technically you could say that even the Echo applies to this. I hope that that continues to change. Uh, but I would say don't just buy commercial gateway or hub devices from large vendors because I don't think that they're incented to sell you something that doesn't, again, just have another Wi-Fi chip in it. Uh, if you are interested, do buy hubs or build your own hubs that use open source technologies. There are great examples out there of hubs that you can build yourself with even just a Raspberry Pi. Now, you are signing up for being your, your house's own IT person. 
And I totally get that. But I think the way that we get to a world of building more peer-to-peer -peer systems and having better peer-to-peer -peer options is by those of us in this room and others being willing to do these kinds of things ourselves and then share them. And along those lines, the final thing that I would say, or the second to last thing I would say as a developer, is to check out some of these P2P computing platforms that are emerging in this space. iota.org is an interesting one. Uh, Streambit and Filament are two others as well. This is not a huge why. Unfortunately, there aren't like thousands of companies out there just hoping to be like the distributed P2P pervasive computing network because most people I think are still assuming that it's all just going to be a cloud centralized model. Uh, but we, I think the more interest that we show in things like this and even help that we give to these types of projects, I think the better our chances are we'll be landing these kinds of models in the houses and in the cities of the future. And then finally, <clears throat> when you build apps of any kind, I don't care what they are, whether they're web apps or mobile apps or even building your own IoT devices, um, please never assume internet connectivity. Because the reality is that if we do get to a world of trillions of devices and we're still in a client server model, your mobile app's going to crash too. So you might as well start building now like it's going to need to function offline. You might as well build your web app now like it's going to function offline. Take a look at emerging standards like the Web of Things standard that allows pervasive computing technologies and concepts to work even within the browser, right? Assume peer-to-peer -peer capabilities anywhere you can. Now, in some cases, the hardware we buy just doesn't give us the ability to do that. But start experimenting with ways in your apps and devices that you can do, uh, that you can emulate peer-to-peer -peer behaviors and foster peer-to-peer -peer communications between devices. And if we're lucky, if we do all this right, and if we shop well, if we influence vendors, if we build the right apps, we might just get back to that wonderful world of Palm Pilot devices. Thank you all very much. Enjoy the rest of the day.